Moving to Germany is full of excitement and adventure. However, it's not always just sunshine and rainbows. There are different faces like culture shock and dealing with homesickness. And in this video, we're going to talk about the hardships of moving abroad and tips of how you can deal with it. Hey, my name is Jen and I'm from Guatemala. And mine is Yvonne and I'm German. And together we're from SimpleGermany.com, where we create English content to empower internationals to settle into life in Germany more smoothly. smoothly. <laughs> so there are multiple reasons for anyone to consider moving abroad to a new country or even moving within one's own country and leaving home. But in this specific case, of course, we're referring to moving to Germany. And some of those reasons might be seeking a better quality of life, seeking new adventures, new cultures and kind of like getting a fresh look at life, seeking more open mindedness for oneself, but also seeking a new job or new career opportunity that might not be possible at home or wherever you're currently living. It could also be to live your true self, like what Jen has often mentioned already, and not be judged for whatever reason by your family or friends just because this is how always things have been done in the family. It could also be to seek more security, also a big part of Jen's quest, right? And it could also be uh, the quest for more happiness, whether you actually know that it's what you're looking for. So of course, all this sounds amazing. However, a friend of mine once told me everything has a price. So you need to pay for all these rewards in some sort of way. Some of those payments might be leaving behind your family if you're not moving with them to Germany, leaving behind friends, you know, like friends from home that you probably grew up with, leaving behind your culture, your language in some cases, if you don't come from like the German speaking areas, of course. <laughs> you could also potentially be leaving behind your job or career path opportunities in your home country to start maybe from scratch a new career in Germany. And also most likely you will leave behind and your food, which in some cases, in my personal case, it's one of the things that I have struggled with the most, I would say. So when you land on in Germany, or if you have been here for some time, you are probably familiar with the stages of moving abroad to a different country. And uh, doing some research, we found that actually there are five stages when you move to a new place. Stage number one is preparation. Right, in the preparation phase, as many of you are in, it's exciting, you're, there's also a little bit of nervousness, sometimes a little bit of overwhelmedness, you know, but generally speaking, it's like a positive feeling. Yes, also some sense of fear, maybe doubt. Should I be doing this? Is this the right decision? But I would say, generally speaking, if moving to Germany is the thing you want to do, is more excitement than the other emotions. And then when you land to Germany comes the very beautiful phase, which is phase number two of honeymoon phase. That is when you're in love, right? When you're in love with a new place, that is when you're, everything that you see and notice is exciting and beautiful. And it's just this perfect picture that you, of course, have painted before in your mind. Yes, of course. And according to some research, this, I mean, it's very individual how long this phase lasts for each person, but on average, it could last around two months where everything is just fresh and exciting, like you say, and it's just, you know, the honeymoon phase where you're just in love and so happy to be in a new country. Despite the bureaucratic hurdles. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Which hopefully we, we help you uh, beat a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but then comes phase number three, and that is actually the culture shock phase. The culture shock phase can last, again, it depends on every individual, between six to 12 months. So it really takes some time to adapt pretty much. And that is, you know, filled with confusion with feeling lonely with feeling out of place hmm. with doubting what the hell am i doing here why am i not with my friends and family i will never learn the language fully all those overwhelming feelings Yes, definitely. And especially during this time, it's crucial that you are aware that the sense of homesickness will kick even stronger than what you felt maybe in the honeymoon phase or you will feel after that. And then comes what I consider the golden phase, which is phase number four, and that is adaptation. And that's when you finally feel like you're settling in. I must say again, it really depends on each person how long this takes. Honestly speaking, for me, this took around two years to actually feel that I was starting to understand how things worked in Germany, trying to get the feel for it, you know, um, and that is a very long time if you think about it. I also have to be very honest and two particular things happened that actually helped me feel a little bit more settled in. Number one is starting to learn German more and trying to speak more at least on the streets in the supermarkets maybe at the bars and places like that and number two is actually meeting Ivan. i would say having a german partner is really helpful and it's like a key to unlock a little bit of the culture and to pick the brain a little bit of why things work a certain way and trying to understand and just have open conversations of the cultural differences so yeah which doesn't mean that you need to have a german partner no definitely not but i'm just saying from my experience yeah. these are the two things that help me to adapt other people have found other ways 
ways to adapt, of course, uh, but I can only speak from my personal yeah. experience, right? <laughs> and phase number five is the so-called repatriation or also known as reverse culture shock, which, you know, there's also quite a few videos out there when uh, people, especially uh, US Americans who have lived in Germany, go back to the US and then have their reverse culture shock because suddenly what they knew home was like is different or they don't understand anymore because the way things work in Germany are so different and it all just is a mix and you're feeling confused about everything and kind of like you don't belong home anymore either. So that could also happen. Yes, that's true. I would say this phase number five especially is true if you decide to move away to Germany to go back home. It's not necessarily, um, you know, just because you go and visit, you might feel it. But if you decide to move back home, this is a fit when the fifth phase kicks in again. But in this video, we're going to actually concentrate on phase number three, which is culture shock and how to deal with the homesickness. <laughs> Now, when talking about culture shocks, often people or we imagine like this one big thing that just kind of like derailed you. But that doesn't have to be the case. Usually culture shock comes with very many few little details that just all pile together and make you feel confused. Like in just very many different situations. Yeah, something as little as not having seamless conversations. It might seem so trivial, but if you think about it, maybe at back home with your mother tongue, you were just able to engage with people in conversations and ask questions, and it was super fluid and easy. In Germany, because it's German, right? <laughs> and if that's not your mother tongue, then of course that becomes an extra hurdle and effort to try to, how do I communicate this? How do I say these things? What are the words needed? And suddenly it becomes this mush of, emo of things that may be the thing you want to ask you don't end up asking it because it just became so confusing in your head and it's actually quite a draining process I would say especially because we also know through studies and other experiences also ourselves included that when you speak a different language your personality somehow changes the tone the, of voice changes the tone of your voice the personality also like the words that you use because uh, it's different communication methods, so to speak, right? Humor changes, uh, so that's also super interesting. So it might seem as a trivial thing, but that just it becomes an exhaustive thing that you need to do every day in a new country, which, you know, after some time, it is like, okay, I, I kind of need a break from all the German speaking. <laughs> Another thing that might seem very trivial is actually understanding food. First of all, what kind of food like it's eaten in the country, but also if you go to like the traditional canteens, it's called in Germany, which are the cafeterias for certain companies. Some of them actually have the menu in English and everything, but a lot of them still only have the stuff in German. So that means that you have to remember, okay, what was this food? What is it called? You have to remember it. And something as simple as maybe ordering salad with different toppings becomes super overwhelming because you don't remember the name or you don't know if you're supposed to point at it and the person doesn't and understand, you know, so it becomes these little things through time that just become very overwhelming. And that's when you hit, I think, the culture shock stage. If I have to talk from my personal experience, my culture shocks happen specifically when dealing with a lot of rules and regulations, which are in Germany, compared to my home country, Guatemala, where there are there are rules, but like, do people follow them? Not necessarily. Versus here in Germany, everyone or the majority of people, we cannot generalize, right, <laughs> are so proper, right? Another thing is dealing with humor. I still don't understand German sense of humor most of the times. I understand it a little bit. I think I've cracked it a little bit, but not to the extent that I'm super confident in it. I tend to be quite a funny person, I think. And uh, it's been hard to adapt on saying a joke that actually makes Germans laugh. Ah, but you've you've entered that area. Sometimes, because sometimes I still say a joke and everyone just looks at me like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it still happens. <laughs> And of course, is the directness of people that we've mentioned in so many other videos. That for me has also been such a big struggle to understand that when Germans tell you something bluntly, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're angry, they're just being very direct. So as an example, actually very recently, we went to actually return a, a piece of cloth uh, to a store because it was damaged. And while returning it, the person on the counter was listening and then didn't say anything. And the first thing she says, I need your customer card. And oh, sorry, we didn't bring it, you know, forgot it maybe with my last name. And then she sighed and then she looked into the system and then she started cracking jokes and being super friendly. And I was like, what? Okay, so at first she was like super rude, but then she was super friendly. Uh, it, it's still a very confusing scenario. And I would say she was not being super rude. She was just <laughs> doing her job, being direct. That's what she needed to pursue. And then while she was actually doing the transaction, 
you know, she had some time to joke around. Yeah, you mean to pursue, because you said pursue, and I think that's different. Oh. <laughs> Other things that I have personally struggled with is learning the traffic rules, especially for cycling, oh my God, and for driving as well. Uh, they tend to be, uh, they're very different from the Guatemalan rules. <laughs> Let's just say there are rules that we follow <laughs> here in Germany. But I would say the hardest part, and this is where the danger comes when you move to a new country and only have international friends, and that's when the international friends start moving abroad. Because uh, not everyone stays in Germany for a longer period of two years sometimes. Three years have been the mark. I've noticed that at three years, if you have international friends, they tend to leave, either go back home or move on to a different country or a different city. Um, and that, I think, is the tough part when you think you have friends that you can settle in and then they all go and then you're alone again. And of course, there's this feeling of homesickness that just sometimes comes. For me, again, personally, there are like stages or as, uh, not stages, but times throughout the year where homesickness is stronger than other times for some reason. Easter is one of them, which is super weird because back in Guatemala, Easter is a super massive holiday, which I never participated fully in it. But it's you just know this exists, time, right? right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's this time that everyone is just off and there's like parties and fun. I did participate in those part of things, but it's a big religious thing as well, different topic. Um, and Christmas also is a big time where I sometimes feel homesick uh, just because of the different traditions and the different things that we used to do back home that are so different. Yeah, and it's Germany. family time. I would say Christmas is probably the number one time where you feel homesick. I felt homesick back in the day when I was in the US over Christmas. Yeah. Uh, on the ships, it was always, you know, it's just a sense of like, <sighs> it would be nice to be home right now, but yeah. then um, you just mingle and it gets better. Yeah, that is true. So the definition of homesickness actually means that you're longing home while you're away from it. It's pretty simple. Yeah. In German, the word is Heimweh. And actually, weh means like, like it's hurting. So you're, like, mm. you're in pain from home. That is super interesting. Interesting fact, actually, is that in the 18th century, there was a word invented called nostalgia, which we all know about it, right? And actually, nostalgia means the acute homesickness. Mm. So in the 18th century, 19th century, according to this TED talk that I saw, <laughs> homesickness was a thing, especially because this was a time where a lot of people were migrating everywhere, conquering in some aspects as well. And homesickness was actually like... Um, very strong feeling that a lot of these people had to the extent that for acute homesickness, which was also considered, I don't know if it was really like a sickness per se, the word nostalgia was invented. And homesickness was part of poetry, part of like paintings, part of even news uh, news articles of people actually um, sometimes even committing suicide because they were homesick. It was a really big topic. Hmm. But somehow in the 20th century, homesickness is no longer talked about, even though I would say we probably live in a more movable or like where people move more more uh, era yeah so it becomes maybe also more standard of living in a way like standard of life yeah and nowadays uh, we would say that homesickness often gets referred to being weak right mm. not being strong enough to endure being away from home yeah which i think it's kind of like a little a little trap that we all fall into because it shouldn't be seen that way it should be seen like in the 19th century as something and a feeling to be acknowledged and to be treated in a way through yeah. different things right a very subjective opinion opinion of mine is that it depends how strong your homesickness is depending on whether you move to Germany because you wanted to and that's a thing that you it's your dream and you want to be here versus if you were forced to and I also would say not only that but also whether you're moving to Germany with an open-ended time frame mm. or you're moving to Germany or any other country with I know I'll be there for a year or two also true because that if you have an end date you know okay I might make the best out of it and you don't feel it as much as you know you're moving your whole life and then you're not going back home ever right and also for me I've realized a lot of the times homesickness has to do with this romanticizing the idea of how life in Guatemala was so I tend to romanticize oh I used to for example eat this dish and that's not true. Sometimes I would probably eat it once or twice in my whole life, but I just romanticize the idea of it. Another example that I have is maybe romanticizing the idea of speaking my own language. Yes, we do speak Spanish in Guatemala, but it's a Guatemalan kind of Spanish where, of course, you have your slang words and like you, you understand each other very coolly. <laughs> um, and of course, it's this, oh, I wish I could speak so easily with someone. And then when I'm back home in Guatemala, well, this is home. Or you're on the phone. Or I'm on the phone. I get to speak my mother tongue. I would say it's broken a little bit because of the amount of years that I've been away. However, I've realized that because my life has evolved into something completely different in Germany than the life of my friends in Guatemala. So even though we speak the same language, our mentality and and, and views of life have totally shifted. So at the end of the day, maybe speaking someone in English that is more aligned to the mentality that I have now, it's more rewarding than actually speaking 
my mother tongue with friends where it's a little bit more certain topics we don't talk about, certain things, you know, it's hard to explain. Where the language is fluid, but not the conversation per se. Hmm. So now that we have all this context, here are six tips that we have uh, discovered that helps at least for my homesickness, which maybe help your homesickness as well. <laughs> and number one, I just mentioned it earlier, and it's really the number one tip is whenever you have this feeling of it doesn't matter how strong it is of homesickness, go out and mingle with people. Don't isolate yourself. And this is actually what we also back in the day when I sent like young Germans abroad for like summer vacation. The number one thing we always told them, because there's a lot of home homesickness at that age mm. and at that time, go be active, join the activities, go meet other people, talk about it. Because the moment you put yourself in a room and just stay quiet, that's when it actually gets stronger. Yes. A hundred percent. Number two, which has, has actually I've discovered recently and it's worked wonders for me is to cook something from your country. I'm not a great uh, kitchen cook person. Actually, <laughs> I am a sous chef to Yvonne's amazing cooking. <laughs> so obviously there's a lot of dishes in Guatemala that are like super complicated to make and maybe one day I'll be able to make them. But I try to get like the, the easy ones. So recently, actually in Dusseldorf, there's a market called Karlsplatz and there we discover that they sell hibiscus uh, dry leaves. And in Guatemala, like in other parts of, of, of Latin America, like Mexico, I know, for example, we drink hibiscus tea. It's called hibiscus tea for summer. So when we discovered this, we immediately went home. I did. I, I googled like Guatemalan hibiscus tea. We actually did it at home. We actually shared, shared it with some German friends who absolutely loved it. And that was just such a nice feeling to have a little bit of a taste from home in Germany. I would say it wasn't 100% so as my pleasing because uh, Ivan prefers it with almost no sugar, which makes it a little bit too bitter for my taste, but it was close enough, I would say. <laughs> so again, it doesn't have to be this complicated dish that you do. It can be just a little thing. And if you're wondering, where do I get my stuff, Jen? Actually, in Germany, there's tons of specialty stores that you can just Google, for example, Latin American stores in Dusseldorf. And actually, there's at least three that I know of where they sell Latin American products. So just make sure to like, find your speciality and, and Google it. Another thing is that a lot of sometimes Turkish and African speciality stores tend to have also Latino things in it, funnily enough, or Arabic things. So there's a mix and match. So as long as you find an, a speciality store, your bet that you'll find something from home is very high. Yeah, also in the like um, international sections in larger supermarkets. Yeah, not gonna taste 100% the same, but close enough, close I would enough. say. <laughs> Number three is to find friends or community from your home country or as close as it gets to your home country. Right? For Jen, it's rarely Guatemalans just because they're like very rare, yeah. but mainly like Latino in general. Yeah. And of course, as much as we encourage you to find German friends, it is also important to have someone you can talk to that relates to your situation, that has gone through what you are going through, right? And not every German might be able to do that if they have not lived abroad yet, for example. So just find, you know, a community where you um, find some, some support and some understanding whenever you um, feel maybe a little bit sad or down. Yeah, exactly. For example, in our case, we have a lot of Mexican friends in our life. And interesting enough, it's like a Mexican German couple most of the times. Right. So it's really interesting because we can talk both. And I think you can also talk to the Germans from a perspective of dating a Latino. In wow, certain I talk more to the Latinos. <laughs> but also we can relate with the Latinos of dating a German. And that's it, it tends to be funny conversations. But I think it's good for the soul yeah. just to be able to to talk to other people from as close to your home country or your home country in general. Number four, and I cannot emphasize this enough, is to learn. <laughs> German, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I have to be the first one to tell you that I'm not the best German speaker. I don't think I will ever be. And I have uh, realized that for myself and I accept it and it's okay. But I think my German is good enough that I can have small conversations with, with Germans to break the ice a little bit. And I would say you still undermine yourself because by now they are not they're way beyond small conversations. <laughs> I think the feeling that you have why you don't say big conversations is because if it's a group of people, hmm. just like with any foreign language, I would say that you're not 100% sure of is that you get overwhelmed when there's too many locals talking in their own language and you're just there trying to pick up the conversation. That's true. Or it's like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with hmm. someone extremely academic that hmm. uses vocabulary that even I sometimes struggle yeah. with. <laughs> so, German is good. It's not 100% fluid. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> However, I think the learning the German really breaks the ice with Germans. Uh, I have this example that I worked in this telecommunication company where the majority of people were German. And I think because I made an effort to speak German to the German speakers, not forever, obviously, but good enough, um, that it broke the ice and they saw me more also like as a friend and they would invite me for coffees and beers and parties versus other international coworkers. They would only uh, speak English and not make an effort. And, I, and they would rarely get invited to these uh, events. 
I don't know, like it has, I think it has a correlation in a way. Because I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Germans, but <laughs> if you make an effort to Germans in the first attempt, that gives a very good impression. And then Germans tend to relax a little bit and are okay with opening a little bit more in English. And, because, and also get curious. Yeah, yeah. They get curious. Our tip number five is that you should probably not spend the most amount of your time on your social media profiles that are filled with images and posts from friends or family at home. Yes. Because that doesn't help. Hmm. Because you're again living like in a parallel society kind of like online you're living at home but your real life is happening here in germany or elsewhere and you know you should of course still keep in touch with your family and friends but don't make that the number one thing or priority in your life here yes give yourself the space and the time to develop your life also here in germany and then you can start posting your own stuff just from your life in germany right <laughs> if you're into social media. <laughs> Number six is to speak about it. As we said, in the 19th century, homesickness was a thing that was open in society and people can talk about it freely. So find friends and, and family members that you can maybe talk about it. And usually that helps to relieve the sensation of homesickness. However, if helping with your friends or family does not help, by the way, we're not doctors or by any means a psychologist or anything, but if you have the feeling that you need to talk with someone more professional about this uh, topic, there are tons of services out there that can help you with this. And it doesn't, mental health tends to be a very taboo topic in Germany. So unfortunately, you cannot just go as easy with your public health insurance to a, psych, a psychologist or a coaching or, or anything like that, because it's a hurdle, I would say. So you would need to pay for these services from your own pocket. And there's actually a very cool company that just popped up in, um, in Germany and it's called Complicated.life. And there you can have an abundance of different psychologists that have different backgrounds from different countries, speak different languages, have even different methods of treating patients and you can get a you it's kind of like a tinder i would say so you put your profile and you say what you're looking for and then they match you with the potential psychologist um, and it's quite affordable so if you need help in that sense be sure that you're not alone and there's help out there that can that you can find as well in germany online by the way and some of them actually are in person or in real life yeah. yeah yeah so that's pretty cool moving to a new country is a very brave thing to do And you need to give yourself the space, the time, and the kindness to yourself to be able to adapt to the new life. To It's okay to not understand everything at the first try. It's okay to make mistakes. It's totally part of the journey. As I have mentioned before, it took me two years to start feeling somewhat that I can, you know, uh, navigate life in Germany. And it also took me meeting a German partner to unlock the secrets, let's call it, of German culture. However, if I have to speak very honestly, it's only in the past few months that I have realized that, wow, Germany is a country that I don't want to leave and it's going to be my home forever. And that, my friends, has been 10 years in the making. It is not an easy journey, but the rewards for me personally have been beyond the sacrifices that I had to leave home, like many of you have. And it's also okay if you say at some point, you know what? This was too much. The price is too high. I also want to go home. But it's okay that you acknowledge this. At least you tried it and you gave yourself the space and the encouragement to proceed forward. If you would like to know more about my journey and how I ended up in Germany and how all these things happen, then you can check out the video that's there. Make sure to click there. Until next time. Cheers. Cheers.